I'm here today to talk to you about something new in the, in the framework of the, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL, uh, which Zoe introduced you to. And that is that finally, after the Bay Program has existed since 1983, and it's only now, um, more or less since December, that the partnership is crediting land conservation and land use planning for the effects of those activities on reducing nutrients to the Bay. So how did this come about? Um, well, one is when you show people these population numbers of the Chesa this is just for the Chesapeake Bay from 1950 going out. And as we go out into the future, these are based on um, county level population projections produced by every state. So in Maryland, it's Maryland's Department of Planning uh, population projections. But basically, the population increases more or less a million per decade. It's been doing that. It's projected to do that in the future. There's, you know, maybe it's going to be 900,000 in a decade or 1.1 million, but it's a pretty safe bet in the near term that this population trend is going to continue. And when the Bay TMDL was put into place in 2010, one of the things that the, the TMDL said was you have to account for growth and loads as you're planning your, your reductions as you're planning to install all these engineering practices, you have to account for potential increases in loads over time. So the partnership basically was like, well, you know, we're going to, we started this TMDL in 2010, so that we're just going to plan everything based off of 2010. And so other people said, well, aren't you planning to install engineering practices between then and 2025? And then isn't the population of the Bay Watershed going to increase by 2 million? So aren't you ignoring the impact of 2 million people if you do that? And in December, all the states, six states in the District of Columbia said, yeah, that's probably not too smart. We should account for the population and account for that growth. And we need a systematic way to do it, which is where my group comes in, um, introducing a land change model into the mix. So another thing I like to show people when we're talking about growth, and this is um, you all know this professionally and personally, but if you look at housing densities in this region, and we've got uh, Baltimore here, DC here, housing density in 1940 before, um, or basically right before the US entered World War II, um, 1950, 60, 70. Okay, now here's when the observations of lowered um, catches and landings of uh, fish and shellfish really started to alarm people. And you know, also in the 70s, that's when basically you know, rivers were catching on fire in Ohio. And we had a lot of different issues. And that's when all our environmental regulations, most of them, were passed in the early 70s. So it was also the time where scientists recognized that the bay was really starting to decline drastically since 1950. And well, why was that? Well. You've got the interstate highway system that went into the 50s. You've got the Bay Bridge that went into the, into the 50s. You have all the kind of, you know, Levitt Towns kind of suburban sprawl that happened in the 50s and 60s, most of it with very little environmental controls. So if you go from 1950 to 1980, we did a lot of damage to the environment. And in the Bay watershed, that's an increase of about 5 million people. Since 1980, we've added another 5 million people, and we've decreased nutrients. We've decreased nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment substantially despite that increase in population. So we're making a huge difference with the environmental regulations, but more than 80% of it's due to point source controls. Controls on wastewater treatment plants, pipes on people's cars, pipes shooting stuff into the air. That's where the progress has been made mostly. And what we have moving into the future is non-point source controls to deal with. And that's going to be a significant challenge. So 80, 90, 2000, 2010. Don't have a 2020 slide yet. But so this is real, kind of what happened. And there are a lot of trends that indicate that it may not continue in this direction, at least not at the rate that it has. Um, but that's kind of largely up to a lot of people, including yourselves, on how that pans out. Now, you know, up to 2010, talking to water quality managers about land use was like you know, beating your head against the wall. They don't care. I mean, not that they don't care personally, but professionally with a water quality hat, they don't really care. Because if you just you know, put in this zoning, um, you, know, you, you put in this zoning plan, 
or you um, conserve some land and protect it from future development, that's not doing something immediately necessarily to change the way nutrients and sediment leach off that landscape. But when you're looking into the future, it makes a big difference. And so now, um, what the Bay Program partners have agreed to is to kind of adopt that TNC protocol, it's called RED, or Reducing Tropical Deforestation, where you get credit for avoided land conversion. So both planning and conservation can minimize the conversion of forests and farms in the future or reduce it, and that has an effect on nutrient loads, and it has a measurable effect. So to measure that effect, we have a land change model. We call it, just because we're not that creative, Chesapeake Bay land change model. Um, we take uh, county level population projections and employment projections produced by Maryland Department of Planning, in Maryland's case. And the first thing we do is we estimate infill and redevelopment county by county. And this is extremely important because a lot of growth doesn't result in the conversion of forests and farms to development. And infill rates vary county by county. And even the most rural counties in Maryland and elsewhere in the watershed have some degree of infill based on how we measure it, which I'll discuss in a minute. But if it's not infill, then it's greenfield development. It is, it, um, horiz it's horizontally um, expanding, taking out forests and farms. And we simulate that stochastically or randomly you know, based on a lot of information, local information like zoning, um, we take into account, you know, a probability, looking at the past 10 years of where growth occurred relative to factors that influence growth. We take into account proximity to roads, protected lands, steep slopes, um, where sewer service areas are, where priority funding areas are, and all that goes into this kind of random simulation of growth. And we do it randomly because we want to quantify uncertainty associated with our forecasts, and we want to be able to say, on average, in a small watershed, this is how much development we expect to occur, how much conversion, but here's your kind of plus or minus error rates. So all this turns into a feature map, which is overlaid on the present map. As of 2013, we mapped one meter land use and land cover across 100,000 square miles, full county coverage for every county in Maryland. And then we'll be updating that map about every five years moving into the future. And that's what, we, that's what we use to kind of validate our models and validate also the, the planning, the effects of planning, and the effects of conservation. So we, we're doing full state in the Mid-Atlantic because nobody likes to have their state chopped up into the Chesapeake Bay. So we, we model full state and we model it 30 meter resolution. And, um, uh, and I'll show you some examples. So for Maryland, this is, these are the residential infill and redevelopment rates by county that we have going into our model based on what happened over the 2000s. And for us, infill and redevelopment is we look with satellite and we say how much impervious surface has changed from 2000 to 2010. And then we use census data and we say what's the change in employment? What's the change in housing in that same area? And we also look at the underlying neighborhood densities. What's the maximum possible density of any particular place? And we say, at the maximum possible density, did we see with satellite the amount of development that we expected to see? And if we didn't see that, we assume that there must have been vertical growth, not just horizontal growth. And some portion of that goes into infill and redevelopment. So we have commercial infill and redevelopment rates, obviously. Um, and intuitively, you know, they're higher than the residential. Um, we also, and by incorporating infill, we have a much better stati statistical fit on being able to predict the or translate the relationship between growth and housing and employment with a footprint on the landscape. Um, we also look at the proportion of growth, both residential and commercial, within urban areas. And um, so this is an example just for residential. You can see some of these numbers are really high. And we define urban areas with census urbanized areas, plus the priority funding areas, um, plus kind of a buffer around that. So we have our own kind of model version of, of urban. And we do that because our urban is defined by a probability surface which changes through time. So what is urban is not fixed as we, tr as we forecast further into the future. 
So here's actually Richmond, Virginia. So gray is developed, green is forest, orange is agriculture, and these little light yellow and fuchsia dots, that's res new residential, uh, new commercial development <coughs> simulated on the landscape. So this is the year 2025. One simulation, two simulations, three simulations, four simulations. We do it 101 times, and then we generate statistics by small watershed across all those runs. And what you can see is the overall patterns from where you're sitting are probably very similar, but the exact location of growth changes. It's stochastic. And this is how we measure our uncertainty. Um, so I already said we kind of sum everything up over 101 runs. And here's Ken Island where I live. I live right here. Um, any modeler probably worth their salt models their backyard first and then says, hey, shows their wife, look what I did. <laughs> um, but so here's one development here that we've simulated, a residential patch, right? So that patch, the size of that patch is based on the distribution of patch sizes in the state of Maryland. When we simulate Maryland, we parameterize our model. Everything's unique for Maryland. And we, we do Virginia, it's unique for Virginia. But under this little yellow patch, we have data on how large it is, how many households, whether it's on sewer or septic, what the lot sizes are, what, how much is impervious, pervious, how much used to be farmland, how much used to be forest land. And all this has a loading, major nutrient loading implication. So we sell so 101 runs, millions of patches, use R, it's a great program for crunching all that stuff. But what we do is we simulate the future and in the future, we will have another high resolution land cover map. And that's where the credit comes. You planned your restoration effort based on a simulated future that included zoning, included things that you thought were important and were gonna happen in the state of Maryland. And this is in Maryland's phase three WIPs. Um, so this is what was kind of planned and this is what happened. Do you get credit or not? Well, we compare the two basic maps. And if you said, we're going to really do a great job controlling growth, and what happened? You didn't do a great job controlling growth, but the economy tanked and no growth happened. From a water, now put the water quality back hat, hat back on, no one cares, right? You, you, you did your job. <laughs> it didn't happen. Or you didn't do your job and Amazon put their headquarters in your backyard. You didn't have any control over that, but you do have to mitigate it because that's a big impact. Um, so we're doing different scenarios, and every state, including Maryland, is going to develop their own customized future scenario to serve as the basis for their phase three watershed implementation plans going out to 2025. MDE is the lead, but DNR and Department of Planning are also involved. Um, and I would encourage you guys to try to get involved in that. We have two baselines. One is a, a future scenario, say the past is prologue to the future. The second one includes zoning. So those two baselines. Here's where we have zoning data. We have it for all of Maryland. Um, and we have simulated a few stock scenarios to show people what the effects of different policies can be on nutrient loads. These are forest conservation, growth management, and agriculture and soil conservation. These have been simulated as exclusive. So forest conservation doesn't include any growth management. Ag conservation doesn't include any forest conservation. We did that on purpose to tell people and show people that you should never do this. Because any good scenario involves a combination of all three. So each of these scenarios is set up as a lot of organizations and agencies are doing a lot of things that achieve a specific effect. And what do they achieve? Well, for forest conservation, conserve all riparian zones out to 100 feet. Conserve all wetlands, all areas subject to a one meter rise in sea level out to 2100. Don't develop in Crisfield. All land surrounding national wildlife refuges to allow them places to retreat. And then for growth management, we have the ability to increase densities by user specified percentage, expand sewer service areas, increase infill rates, kind of you get the picture. So each of these kind of sets of bullets, this is forest conservation, growth management, and ag conservation, go into these scenarios and we simulate, it, simulate them. And how the effect they have on loads depends a lot on the patterns of land use within any one jurisdiction. 
we simulate county by county. There's no leapfrogging in our model. A county says, this is how much our future population is going to be. We're like, fine, you have to deal with it. We're just going to look at what the footprint from that future population is going to be. So in Anne Arundel County, protecting forests is going to shift, and in most cases, shifts development onto farms. Because if you don't do any growth management, you're just moving things from one place to another. Protecting rural areas, which down here are in the southern part of Anne Arundel and are mostly farmland, pushes development closer to the urban core, which is, happens to be the more forested part of the county, or at least the, the kind of the bleeding edge of growth in Anne Arundel is largely forested. So then you get more forest impacts. And doing growth management is fantastic. <laughs> it, it minimizes your impact to both forests and farms. But as I tell the conservation community and others, it does not ensure that the best farms, the most productive farms, and the best forests, the highest quality habitats, are going to be there in the future. That's why you need all three. So here's Maryland. And this dark gray now is developed. Um, and we have areas that can be developed under each of these scenarios, kind of lit, lit up here. So, you know, these, these other areas are either protected or they're so far distant that the chance of development in the next 10 years is very low. <coughs> so that lit, lit, uh, lit up area is where we throw new development, stochastically. And then growth management, well, that takes soils unsuitable for septic off the table. Um, it constrains the pattern somewhat. Um, forest conservation, basically, you're shifting that growth a lot onto ag land and the opposite with farmland conservation. So if we look across, this is just stats for Maryland, and we have these three, four scenarios on top of historic trends and the same three scenarios on top of uh, the second baseline, current zoning. And what you see is the highest impacts to ag, this is a negative, in terms of acres. These are acres, um, comes from the forest conservation scenario. The highest impact to forests and wetlands comes from the strict farmland conservation scenario. And then growth management has the biggest impact on minimizing growth in impervious surface. Um, so those are just some, kind of some generalities. But they vary, the effects vary county by county across the watershed. They're, they vary state by state. And they vary a lot based on the land use patterns in any one location. On septic, for septic systems, minimizing the number of septics in the future is really all about growth management. And that, septics are a big load. They're a big uh, portion of the future load. So here's St. Mary's uh, County. And this is a county where forest conservation is potentially going to have the biggest impact because here's their trend scenario. And then when you conserve forest, you're pushing it on. They don't have a lot of ag land, but what they have is where growth is being shifted. Um, so that has one of the biggest impacts on loads. And we can quantify that because every land use has a different loading rate. And we can say forest conservation on top of historic trends basically will reduce nitrogen loads by 27,000 pounds between now and 2025. If you do it over current zoning, it's less because zoning is doing, playing a role. Um, but it still has an effect. How much does it cost to reduce a pound of nitrogen? Anywhere, this is MDE slide, anywhere from like $10 per pound to thousands of dollars per pound. So we're talking just in St. Mary's County, $300,000, $3 million worth of value from doing a lot of forest conservation. Um, this is almost the last slide. So we've done this throughout the whole watershed. This is a map of kind of development pressure. Bluer is higher pressure. And just as you can see, up the I-95 corridor is where most of that, and kind of the peripheral counties, is still where we expect most of that pressure to be. Thanks. No, that, my son did that when he was 13. <laughs> and I, I haven't shared it to the director yet, so. <laughs> so yes. 
so that, that was really interesting to me. How, how are these results being shared? Are people aware of them to use them to kind of change how things are happening? Right, well, and this is where, um, for Maryland, it has to do with the, the process that Mar Maryland is implementing for their phase three watershed implementation plans, which will be implemented or developed basically over the next year. And so, to the, from the planning perspective, especially at the local level, you want your information to be in that, to be in that plan. And what you think the future that your counties are gonna be in that plan. And um, to do that, contacting you know, Maryland Department of Planning and Maryland Department of the Environment, and I, I should have had their, their WIP, you could probably Google it, who their phase three WIP coordinator is for uh, MDE. That, that's the person you'd wanna say, you know, I wanna be involved in this. We're, I'm doing the same speech to land trusts. And, and saying, you guys have to have your voices heard. The land trusts are mainly talking to Maryland DNR. You guys would probably be talking mostly to Department of Planning. But get involved in that, and then the, the scenario that's developed will have your data in it. So are, they, are you actually going to quantify like the reduction so that local jurisdictions or permit holders can actually take the credit for it? Yes. Yes. And do we know where we are with that? I'm going to step in, Peter, because sure. he, he's at this level, and, and I'm kind of down here. Uh, Maryland Department of the Environment will start rolling out to the WIP teams, um, uh, the watershed implementation teams, um, the, uh, what's being expected by 2025, and, and your information is going to inform that. They're just starting on the Eastern Shore to roll out the meetings of where we are and where we're going. So we have a RIP, WIP co coordinator in our office. I think everybody does in the, in the, in the state. And so we're going to know from what Peter's just done, and I'm fascinated with it because it's really going to help us because we've never gotten credit for land use before, um, to do, um, and then we'll know what, what our expected um, loading reductions are. We already projected what we, what we were, how much we had to do, and now we'll be able to add new tools um, to that. So it's very exciting. Um, can the model optimize the mix of practices to give you the most reduction in load? Um, not yet. It's not set up to do, to do that now. Potentially in the future, but not yet. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Last one. If, the, if, if you have a potential to get quote credit, does that mean a WIP plan might be less aggressive than it would normally have been? Just because you think you're going to get greater gains by doing certain non-structural things, but I, I mean, yes, I, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm just like nervous, like, well, you still have a long way to go, you can get credit, but whether or not, wouldn't be rather just keep that kind of going aggressively, and then if you get credit after the fact, that's really nice. You're further ahead than you plan. I mean, I'm a little wondering, like, whether the credit is going to be to slow up. Well, and that is what the Chesapeake Bay Foundation is very worried about. Um, the, the response to that is that every two years we're going to update all the models, all the inputs to the models. So moving between now and 2025, every two years everything's going to be updated and we're going to be collecting um, hotspots of land cover change every two years and then fully remapping every five. So that's the, the kind of validation of you know, a jurisdiction could be like, well, I, need, I can slow up because planning and conservation are going to achieve all these things. And then in every two years, we're going to like, yes, no, maybe. And that's the adaptive management, that the jurisdictions are going to have to really adapt and say, in response every two years to new information, are we going in the right direction? Do we put more money here, less money here? So um, it's not like we're just going to put our blinders on to 2025 and then look back. 